Hey, it's Tim. And it's Amy from Go With Less. You're listening to the Earn and Invest podcast. It was always the most awkward part of any social gathering. So what do you do for a living? The question sent me into a spiral of self-doubt and even embarrassment. At the time, I thought it was because admitting that I was a medical doctor was making a spectacle of myself. Years later, I would realize that my profession no longer matched my internal sense of purpose and identity. My outsides no longer matched my insides. There was an uncomfortable disconnect. So it was no surprise that I didn't form a community around my profession. I felt awkward in the physician's lounge. I had no doctor friends. I felt alone. When I discovered personal finance, podcasting, and public speaking, I finally felt like I had latched onto my true purpose. And when I met people with the same interests, I felt bonded to them in a way that I never had in the hospital or the office. I had found my people, my community, and that was something that even money couldn't buy. It is priceless. Have you found your community? a group of people who lift you up and reaffirm your sense of purpose and identity? If not, what's holding you back? Tim and Amy Rutherford retired in 2015 in their late 40s. Now they travel the world as full-time nomads. They share their experiences, make friends, and plan meetups in their Facebook group, Go With Less, Nomadic Life, Early Retirement, Travel Hacking, House Sitting, which has grown to over 3,600 members in a little over a year. Amy and Tim, welcome back to Earn and Invest. Amy, tell me, back in 2015 when you retired, did you feel like you were running away from something or running towards something? I'm going to say both. I had a very intense job. I retired from a career in business-to-business sales. I had weekly quotas, monthly quotas, sometimes daily quotas. And I would say that I felt like I was being whipped like a racehorse every single day. And I also would say that I thought that my kind of stressful career was shortening my life. So I, however, I had some of my very best friends to this day were my coworkers, my bosses, my clients. So I didn't dislike everything about it, but I didn't like the the intensity that I was required to, to perform. But I also wanted a life of freedom. So I was running very quickly toward this life of freedom. And it's been almost seven years and every day has been a blessing. Every day has been, I've had that freedom. I guess I had a little mix as well. So I, it, it's been a long time, so I can't even remember. So it's, <laughs> what, what, what that, uh, I wasn't necessarily thrilled with my job. And so, however, when I asked to leave my job, they asked me to stick around for a while. So I stuck around in this weird capacity for 18 months. Is that right, Amy? Yeah. So I, I, even though I wanted to get away, I still hung on for a while, but I think I ultimately it was more, I was, I was running towards freedom. So as a matter of fact, I saw that Amy really left her job a year and a half before I, or about a year before, two years, two, two years two before years. I did uh, completely. And so I saw what she had and I really wanted that. And so that's ultimately why I left my, my part-time work is because I really wanted my freedom. And I'm going to jump in on that. So when Tim says in a quasi work, he was working no more than 15 hours a week as a consultant. So he had no benefits, no salary, and he only worked for the hours he was paid. And what he would say on Sunday, he still had the dreads on the Sunday, the pit in his stomach, and he still had a to-do list of 100 items. And he looked at me finally after a year and a half of doing this and said, you know, I want what you have. So we thought that his five, 10, 50, his other weeks, he had zero. So he didn't have to work 15 hours. It was up to him. We, when we traveled, he'd have many weeks of zero and that was fine. So, uh, but he still felt guilty. He still, he said, I might have the, the, I don't have the hours that I used to have at my job, but the, I didn't let go of the mental piece of it. That's still with me. We, we would go to the movie at, at noon on a Wednesday and I felt guilty about being there, even though I didn't have, I was free to do whatever I wanted. I still had this weird obligation around the 15 hours a week that I wasn't even, it was just, it was weird. So I was happy to be done. Tim, tell me what your economics looked like back then. Were you pretty certain back in 2015 that you had enough? Was there any fear that maybe you would run out early? 
we, we thought we had enough money. And I, I still think even to this day, we, we worry about uh, not having enough money. So we spend way less than what we can. Uh, we talk about on our channel about uh, we, we try we were trying to spend about $36,000 a year. We just gave ourselves a raise. Now we're intending to spend about $48,000 a year. So from a safe withdrawal standpoint, uh, we're, we're under 3%. Way and under. Way under 3%. So I, I still think we have this... Um, we don't know sort of scenario, even though uh, we're pretty comfortable with what we're doing. I'm going to jump in here because I feel very differently. The math works, but that doesn't mean there's, there's a mental piece to this. And we were on your show several years ago about withdrawing. And it's a very big deal to, uh, to uh, when you've been saving in one direction to not be saving and to be spending, that is a mental shift. And it's not, I don't think that I've just jumped the, the the canyon and I'm on the other side. So as we just gave ourselves a raise, we aren't even spending 2% of our safe withdrawal rate. So we, we on, on paper, the math totally works. But the longer that we're away from work, the more we're not going back to work. And we have also found all kinds of hacks to make this life less expensive if we want it. Um, but still, it, it like I think we're hardwired to be kind of careful and frugal about money. So... So even though the math were, it, it's it's seven years later, it still weighs on me a little bit. I, I'm going to say our confidence ebbs and flows. And so at some <laughs> moments I have more confidence than Amy and some moments she has more confidence than me. And so it just sort of depends on the day. So sometimes when the market's not doing what it's supposed to do, then, uh, or I guess it, it's always doing what it's supposed to do <laughs> when it's performing poorly. Um, then it's like, eh, I don't know, uh, you know, is this going to work? We also, we've had this, you hear stories all the time about people who have long-term care requirements that cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year sort of scenario. And so that's something that's always weighed on us. We looked at long-term care insurance years ago and it was kind of unaffordable, but. Um, uh, and not very good. And not very good, it seemed to seem. Amy, talk to me about the nomadic piece. I mean, when you decided to leave your jobs in 2015, was being a no bad even part of your thought process? And if not, when did you develop that idea? We have thought uh, back then when we left, we did think we might be nomads. And then when we settled into some sort of a routine back in 2015, we still had a daughter who was just entering high school. So we had a routine. We went to the gym, we made our, our dinners and all that sort of thing. And what we realized in the early days of our retirement was that we really liked being at home. We liked a routine and we liked being out on the road and traveling. So we thought we'd do about 50, 50, like a month out, a month home, a month out, a month home. And then uh, something changed in 20, 2018, we were planning nine weeks in Europe. Our daughter was off working at summer camp and she was gone for the whole summer. So I was very engaged with planning that. Uh, it was maybe like eight cities or something. And I said, and one of the cities was a month. It was a house sit. So we were in world capitals for three or four days in Budapest, three or four days in Vienna. And I said, there is a lot to see around not just in Budapest and all these cities, but around. And we can't get out of the city, but we don't have enough time to do these huge cities. And let's, I came to Tim, I said, let's cut out our home so that we don't have enough time to see everything we want to see in our lifetime. We want to go back almost everywhere we've ever been. So, so we're never crossing anything off our list is what we've learned. And I said, let's just cut out the middleman. Let's cut out, or let, not, let's cut out the couch. And he said, let's do it. He didn't even have a question or skip a beat. And we've been on the ride ever since. So, yeah. So also I, we, we were spending about, we had a home that was a uh, paid off a hundred percent. And on that paid off home, we were spending about $1,000 a month to, to be in this paid off home. So we figured if we had the equity out of our house in our, our toolkit, as well as this extra $1,000 a month, then that helped uh, fund our nomadic lifestyle. Also, the house sitting really factors into uh, keeping our price point low for being on the road. So, um, but, but basically, the again, the, those two things, the equity out of our house and the extra $1,000 a month that we wouldn't be spending helped us a lot. Amy, talk about the economics of being a nomad. How does it match up to your expectations before you started and your actual cost now that you're on the road? 
Well, the biggest factor here, no surprise, is COVID. So we sold our home January of 2020, ready to go. We had uh, not only flights, but also some house sits, not entirely house sits, booked in Tokyo, Malaysia, Scotland, Spain, all of that canceled in uh, with COVID. And what ha- what we as soon as things started canceling, we realized that our budget was going to go through the roof because now we would have to be paying when we were going to be staying for free at house sits. Well, that's not really, our budget did not go through the roof for 2020. However, Airbnb is what we found in the places that we're looking are about double. And that was not expected. And that's part of why, that's a big part, maybe the part, the reason why we are have given ourselves a raise because it's been very stressful to try to find accommodations at $3,000 when you're paying for accommodations and we like to go out to eat. We spend quite a bit of money on, on that sort of thing. Our, our lodging costs last year were actually very low. So it wasn't so much. So it, it was the potential. So when we were looking to have to pay to be in places when we couldn't, we, we were in houses for 70% of 2021. So our lodging costs were very low. But as we were looking to potentially pay to be in places, it was going to cost us $4,000 a month to basically be in a place where we wanted to be in the States. And so it wasn't, and it wasn't looking too pretty. Our, our biggest uh, thing last year that really... Um, hurt our budget was healthcare cost. Amy had some surgery. And even though we had a highly subsidized ACA plan, uh, we blew through her deductible. And so that was our biggest ouch last year. I, I, I'm going to say our math is our nomadic math is working sort of like we intended for it to work. So um, it, it, it's, uh, and, and we haven't had to eat rice and beans or ramen noodles to sort of make it work. So it, it's working for the most part, like we planned. Yeah, it's still surprisingly affordable. And we also, because of COVID, we were in the United States. That wasn't our plan. We were supposed to be in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America. And we have only been able to get to Mexico, which has helped. Um, but we haven't. We, we were in the United States for about 18 months since we retired. None of that was, was our, our plan. And that was a much more expensive place to be, especially especially with uh, inflation. Amy, I want to move away from this idea of economics and think a little more about how you chose where to go. Obviously, COVID has limited you somewhat, but I'm wondering how much of your decision of which states or even countries to visit is based on geography versus how much of it is based on people you wanted to see? I think the number one thing it's based upon is the weather. So our former home was Colorado, and I have had winter every year of my life in the places that I've lived. I hate winter. So winter, so weather is, is our main force of what's driving us. Uh, so weather, where we may find a house that we don't only house it, as Tim mentioned, it was 70% last year. We're looking for it to be about 50%. So if we find a great, nice house sit, that might move us in a direction. Uh, there's there's kind of, we call them like the, these, 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 what do you call tent poles almost like something that 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 sticks in the ground that that we build around and and then we just move from there so when we were looking so mexico was an easy place for us to get into we had a house that was on the books actually from 2019 we had a house that from thanksgiving 2021 that just ended right after new year's well we were planning around that so so it just it kind of organically grows and sometimes we, so we uh, our good friends wrote some blog, blog pieces about their time in Guadalajara that's where we are now it sounded like a really nice place to be and that affected why we're here we have other friends who needed a place to go they came here because we were here so i think nomad sometimes sometimes it it helps if you're looking at four places and you have friends in one of those places it does it's not unusual that you might go to that the place where you have a community and Amy has this superpower of connecting people. And so something that happens when we go from place to place to place is that there are people there that we connect with because of this community that she's built online. And so it's not so much that we're traveling to see people. It just so happens that we're, when we're in a place, there are people there um, that we connect with. And so when we're in a place for a few weeks, we tend to find 10 or 15 people that are there. And we like have a, uh, a group of friends that we hang with for the entire time we're in a given location. Amy, talk about that aha moment you had when you realized that wherever you stuck your pole in, whether it was because of house sitting or whether it was because of weather, that you could have these meetups and meet up with other nomads and people like you. Was there a moment where it like clicked in your head and you said, oh, I can start <laughs> getting together with people in all these dif- different places? 
It, yes, uh, it, it was in 2020. So Tim and I have been putting out weekly YouTube videos since 2018, and we're sharing our lives real time. So in 2020, we were on a house sit on a farm in rural Tennessee, and we this was uh, April, late April, all of May of 2020. So still, people are very heavily sheltering in place at this point. But we're in the middle of a farm, a 20 acre farm, the perfect place to be. And while we're there, four different couples reached out to me an email and said, we're here, let's get together, we live here. Or maybe we're passing through here or something like that. So four different couples. And I said, well, we weren't so crazy about meeting people, but we did a meeting on park benches and outside with our masks and everything. And slowly we realized that, and, th and this was duplicated everywhere we went. So I didn't say, hey, I'm making uh, meetup plans. We would just say where we are and people would come out of the woodwork and say, we're here too, or we're passing through. And what we heard over and over and over, like almost, it was almost like the same thing every time they would see us. And we share a lot of our lives online. We're very transparent. And they would say, you know, Tim and Amy, you are our only friends who understand what we're doing. You're our only friends that we that, that, that get this. And I said, well, we just met five minutes ago. Like you need new friends. I mean, you need friends locally is, is, is what I'm, I'm getting here. And, and people would say like my family, my coworkers, my friends, they think I'm crazy. They think I'm cheap. They think I'm weird. They think I'm going to fail. They say I'm going to be bored. All of these things, like very little positive. And they are um, like relieved when they meet us. Like we, we, we are, now you're someone that is doing it and we've been dreaming of doing it. And and we heard this all year of 2020 into uh, maybe May of 2021. And I said, I would say on our channel, I need you guys to meet each other. We keep needing you. And I need you to connect together because you're all wonderful. And you have these great stories and you're, and you're, and just like what you said at the intro, like you found your people and a, a viewer of ours texted me or messaged me and said, what you're doing, you're asking for this on the videos. That's not going to do it. You need to create a Facebook group and let's see how that goes. And I didn't know that anybody would join it, which is probably why I didn't create one in the beginning, but I created it and maybe 800, a thousand people joined that same day. And it wasn't even a year ago. It's only, it's been less than nine months. So it's it, now we have 3,600 people in nine months in it. And and my whole goal was to get all my friends to be friends with one another, all my nomadic friends or expat friends doing cool things, early retired friends. So, so now they're meeting all over the world. And, and I, I think that's, uh, I feel like that's my legacy is, is connecting all these people. Tim, were you surprised at how big the expat and nomad communities were and how much they were kind of craving that sense of community? Yeah, I think we are sort of surprised that everywhere we go, it seems like there are people that uh, that we are able to connect with. It's it's kind of incredible. So Amy and I are a little different, I think, and Amy's very extroverted and needs this connectivity. And I I, I don't have that same. I'm a little introverted and uh, don't don't have the same need for it that she does. But the fact that she can not, not only is this great for her in that she she can fulfill her extroverted connecting with people things and we find people all over the place. But it also um, so it extends beyond just just her satisfying that need. Also, she has this, I think, Yenta sort of need <laughs> to connect other people in other places. And so uh, the group is sort of helping to fulfill that as well. So I think it helps in multiple ways. But yes, it is it is surprising to us as we go places how many people there are. I think in the long term, also, Amy has a desire, and I'm speaking for her, so it has a desire to maybe have people follow us to places like we might after be in, COVID. after COVID. Uh, be in Skopje and have uh, a group of people join us in Skopje and be there for a week or two together to sort of have these uh, uh, summer camp like experiences with just a group of friends hanging out and doing the fun things that there are no PowerPoints, but just doing the things that there are to do in a, in a given place. Amy, one thing I found as I talked about in my introduction is I had these people who I went to school with for eight years I had become doctors like them, and yet I found no real sense of internal connection. When we were in the same place, we'd have nothing to talk about. When I discovered things like podcasting and personal finance, I would go to these meetups and feel like I was people's best friend within the first five minutes. Talk about being a nomad. Is that an instant connection when you meet new people? So I have 
always been able to connect with people really easily. And I think that's why I did so well in sales. Uh, clearly, that's why I did. I, I'm, I am meant to connect, whether it's a, a, a product I believe in with a, a customer or friends, like I, I, that's my thing. So, um, so, so just like, but, but because we do share so much of our lives, people who kind of don't get it, don't get it. But those who do really do. And that's the people that I'm looking for. Those are the, who are, that's who I'm looking for. So, so it's incredible because we, we're sharing so much of our lives online. They really do know us. So they say like, I feel like I know you. And it's not like fake. It's like, yeah, you know us. They, as a matter of fact, they know a lot more about our lives than Tim because Tim may forget what happened like six months ago. They're like, do you remember what you ate eight months ago? <laughs> Tim's like, no, I don't even remember recording that video. Um, but when we meet, they say over and over, like, I feel like I found like my, like you're my, like my, you're my, like my, my best friend. And it's not just us. So it's not, this is not just personal to me. People are writing me over and over saying like, I found my best friend through this group. And, and what I'll tell them is, just a heads up, like that isn't random. I've met hundreds of people in this group. Almost all of them are amazing. Keep going. So you think you have found your one best friend. Well, guess what? There's like dozens more, hundreds more around you. So like, so get engaged in the group. The more you're engaged, the more you're going to have these connections. And, and you, t- and we talk about things that normal people don't want to talk about. We talk about spreadsheets regularly and more, most people would think that sounds, if you think that sounds awful, then this is probably isn't your jam. But a lot of people love talking about that stuff. And if you do, then you found your people. So I, I think we have a unique advantage in that, like Amy said, people watch us and they sort of know us and they know what to expect. And so people that maybe approach us and reach out um, are kind of like us. And so I think that we have that unique advantage. And I don't think that all nomads or think the same way we do, but the ones that we happen to run into, and I don't, I don't think this is just luck. I think it's uh, again because we have this online presence and people sort of know what they're signing up for when they when they reach out. But there's there's a wide variety of folks that we run into, and seemingly we love everybody. It's like, yeah, we, yeah. So we, yeah. We, uh, so not only people say you're our, our only friends we know, but we we have a, an instant connection with most of the people that all the people that connect with us. Really. Pretty much. We're talking with Tim and Amy Rutherford, who retired in 2015 in their late 40s. Now they travel the world as full-time nomads. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. Hey, everybody. Just a little update on our ground team. The ground team is a chance for you, an Earn and Invest listener, to become part of my team for my book launch of Taking Stock. That's going to be during the first week of August. We already have almost 100 participants. If you sign up to be part of the ground team, you are going to get extra video. You're going to get snapshots into the book early, and you're going to get other content and blogs Become part of this community. Help me get this book out. Again, we're starting early because the ground team needs to be in place by early August. I hope you check it out. Just go to earnandinvest.com and right up at the top of the page, there'll be a place for you to learn more about the ground team. Come become part of the Earn and Invest and Taking Stock team. Thanks for listening. Let me reintroduce you. We are talking to Tim and Amy Rutherford. They are the creators of the Facebook group, Go With Less, Nomadic Life, Early Retirement, Travel Hacking, and House Sitting. Amy, you described how a friend said, hey, if you really want to connect with people, you need to start a Facebook group. At that time, you had had a blog as well as a YouTube channel. Tell me the difference. What did it feel like to do the Facebook group and how did it change your interactions with people? I'm just going to say our blog is really not so existent. So, yeah, so don't go to the blog. <laughs> it's really a YouTube channel and our Facebook group. Um, the, well, the YouTube community, they, people would leave comments and they would interact with me a little bit. I didn't know too much about them um, and they didn't know each other. And there was almost no, uh, almost nothing in bet- between other viewers communicating with one another. So that's really what I wanted to do was have them meet one another. So with the Facebook group, a day, maybe eight hours after the group started, all of a sudden people, without asking, uh, just popped up introductions. So a face and like, here's who I am. And I think maybe 
I don't know, 75 people did that in the first two days or something. It was a lot of people. So all of a sudden, it was an idea. So I, I, I invited not just like our viewers, I invited people who are my friends. So since 2014, we, we retired in 2015. In 2014 is when we really realized, we, that's when we started reading all the uh, personal finance blogs. So we fired very quickly after we learned about this. But since 2014, I've been, we have been meeting people in all these communities that you mentioned in the nomadic life community, early retirement, uh, house sitting and travel hacking. And I mean, I, so all the podcasters, bloggers, YouTubers in those different arenas have become, or we have, but I slash we have become friends with most of these people. So I invited all of these friends we've had in real life to this group. So it was a really different tone immediately. And I had this vision because there's a, in the, in some of these communities, there's a lot of snark and I, and it turns people off and it turns me off. I'm an, I'm a very no snark person. So I said, I want when people are in this group for it to feel like you've just had a, a hug. Like I want it to be a really warm feeling. And one thing I hadn't realized when I was going to be a nomad is how was I going to take care of this uh, extrovert personality? I, I hadn't thought about that. So all the logistics I had thought of, I never gave a minute thought to how am I going to connect in other places? And the reality is we have been on travels and hadn't connected with anybody in our past. So if we're just in uh, on a house sit in uh, the middle of Grenoble, France, we don't meet anybody and there's no hotels. There's no expats. There's nothing. It's French people going to work and we don't speak a lot enough French to, to communicate uh, relations. Like just, it just wasn't, we weren't making friends naturally. So, so I think this group just facilitated that. And, and again, like, it, I think it was quite different. Our, our YouTube, I look at that more as almost education now. Uh, like you're now watching us live this life from your armchair or you're also a fellow nomad kind of checking out what we're doing. But the Facebook group is entirely about community, connection, information, uh, all of it. I want to talk in a moment about how people are using the Facebook group. But before I do, Tim, did it surprise you how fast this grew? It sounded like you had almost 800 <laughs> members within the first day or two. It was completely shocking. We had no expectations. As a matter of fact, Amy was a little almost like... Uh, fearful that she's going to create this group and two people join. So uh, it, Me was, and you. it was completely shocking. <laughs> yes, it was, it was amazing. And where were people coming from, Tim? Like, did you kind of figure out, was it all uh, so, just family and friends or were people uh, hearing uh, about so, it from so third parties? We had, so Amy uh, brought on a collection of moderators as the group started and I think uh, moderators posted in other groups and it just, um, what, what, what would you say? I think most? most of the groups started with uh, when people would say in, in other relevant groups, hey, I'm trying to find friends where I am. And they'd, and they'd say right away, like, join this group. And it, it snowballed. And then people, the uh, partner would invite their spouse or their sister or their friends who they've like, so it just it became this big spider web of, of connection. And it's growing like very fast. So, so we didn't do anything to really um, market the the group and, and try and, and grow the audience. It just sort of grew organically. Well, we did, we did, we did a video about it. So we start with, I mean, we have a, we, we did a whole video about this and we've encouraged people on our channel to to come and that, that, that helped a lot. I think that was, that was, I mean, we, I had a lot of personal connections and then just doing a whole video about it. That's true. Would have helped. That's true. Amy, talk a little bit about how people are using the Facebook group. What kind of information are they exchanging? What kind of interactions are members having? So the group was started for in-person meetups, and that is happening. So they're happening all over the world. And they, I ask people, please put up a selfie of your meetup every time, because that's why I'm working so hard to make that a success. So I, that's my payback is I want to see these, these, these selfies. So, and it encourages everyone else to like, Oh, this is working. I, I'm going to be able to meet friends through this if I, if I use it appropriately. But then what I, I was surprised by is all, so all the information sharing. So many, many in the group are already like us or way beyond us. They've been nomads for eight years. They've been early retired for, for over 10 years or like, so, 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 the, so what's really cool too, is even though there are subject matter experts in any one of these four umbrellas uh, that we represent, 
each one of them has things to learn about the other umbrella spokes and they're interested. So one of our good friends who is a full-time uh, blogger in the travel hacking space, he's going to become a part-time nomad any week now. He's going to have support in the nomad piece of, of that. And it, and house sitting friends, aren't some of them aren't very good with money and, and, and they're planning their retirement. So now there's people who are really good with money in the group. So it turns out I have learned that someone in that group has experienced any Thing you need an answer to. So if you want to know about how to get to Antarctica on a cruise affordably, post it and there will be many people who have done this and have great uh, helpful information. And people are so, f- have been, it's incredible. People have been so free with the information. Uh, it, it's, it's, the engagement is, is sky high. I, I've had uh, some people say, I think it's getting too big. And I understand that. Um, so I, I, that's why I had so many moderators, 10 moderators, just to make sure that we don't have a lot of uh, stuff in their spam. But what I, I think is that if we're going to be at, in scope G and I, I I need to have some, there needs to be some mass in, number here so that wherever I go, I have a community. And I don't know that we're in popular places where in Mexico is not a, a hard place to, to, there's a lot of expats in Mexico, but there's not a lot of expats in, uh, I don't know, Sofia, Bulgaria that I'm going to know. So now the bigger the group is, as long as we can keep that, uh, the, the snark level down, which we have. I think Amy's also done something really smart to sort of encourage engagement in that every week she profiles somebody, a member of the group. And so I think that encourages people to be engaged because uh, there's just this, um, you know the people in the group. And so I think that that was a, a smart thing that she sort of done to sort of drive engagement with the group. Amy, I want to focus on this idea of in-person meetups because you've mentioned it a bunch of times and a lot of people create online communities because there is no expectation of in-person meetups, right? Maybe people are in disparate places. Uh, maybe people are introverts a little bit like Tim and they don't necessarily want to go out all the time and meet new people. Why was this idea of face-to-face meetup so important to you? I think it's what you said at the beginning. So would you have had that same connection? Would you have had that same feeling if that was in a Reddit group? No, definitely not. That's why. And here's, I'll give you an example. So, I mean, I, I, I met most of these people. I started with them on uh, in YouTube comments, on email, in Facebook comments, things like that. So that's where we started our relationship. But we'll go out for lunch with somebody. We had a lunch this past summer. It started at 11 in the morning and it ended at 10 at night because we were tired. It was an 11 (laughs) hour lunch and that is normal. So we just, I mean, just today is Tuesday on uh, today's Thursday on Tuesday. We met a, a brand new friend here in Guadalajara for lunch. We were with him for maybe two hours. We talked about spreadsheets. We talked about all kinds of cool things. He said, you, there's only one other couple I know, like, you, like he's like us. He said, I, I, you're, you're only the second couple I've ever met who, who does this um, in person. And we had so much fun with him. We said, oh, we're going to meet with other nomad friends tonight for dinner and a movie. Why don't you join us? He's like, I would love to. My New Year's resolution was to get more engaged, have more of a social life. So well, you met the right girl. <laughs> So we were with him all day. We had a great day with him. And he's been really helpful for us because we're looking at Mexican residency and have a lot of questions. We're looking at, we're new in Guadalajara here for seven weeks. He can answer all this. So he's, he's a, a local person. It's a, it's, it's not just a one-way friendship. It's a, it's hopefully a two-way kind of thing. So Tim, you're the introvert. Um, does it ever get awkward? I and mean, then you ever go to one of these meetups and it isn't smooth or you don't I'm have something to talk awkward. about? <laughs> You haven't re- realized that. So, yeah. So, uh, no, I, I I actually like our the connectivity that Amy brings for us. I, I enjoy it. So it's not like I just dread going out and seeing these <laughs> groups of people. It's just not something naturally for me that uh, I, I if Amy weren't in my life, I think I would live in a hut somewhere in the mountains <laughs> or something. I don't know. But or maybe on a beach. But um, so but I, I certainly appreciate what she brings to the table. It's just I, I'm I um, I don't have the same needs that she has to have this connectivity, but I appreciate having the connectivity. Amy, I noticed on the Go With Less Facebook group, there was a word cloud and a prominent place in the word cloud was diversity, the word diversity. Tell me about the diversity of the Go With Less Facebook group and the kind of people you've been meeting. I love that that is what stood out because I think that's my favorite part of the group is the diversity. Um, so, So it's incredible because 
there are people there. I mean, there are many, many LGBT couples and solos in the group. There are many, there are people from all races, uh, all over the world, single couple, older, younger children, not nomads, full-time travelers with the home. There's everything is, is, is there and it's, it's encouraged. And I think that the group is stronger for it. And I think, I mean, I mean, we're, we're, Tim and I are, are travelers because we, we love diversity. We love new things and new cultures and, and we embrace that. So, uh, so it's been, and, and what I see is that the engagement, uh, when you have uh, one of the, like a member with these Monday, these Monday member profiles, when it's somebody who's kind of not your, I don't know, like a, a white couple, I see that the uh, that the likes. I see that like the, the the community is extremely supportive. So I can see that the community wants diversity and they want to see that. And I've I've heard from just around the the interwebs and and around the personal finance space that they, that everywhere doesn't feel so inclusive. So so that's something that that I've always been about inclusivity and and uh, diversity, and and I'm really glad that it's represented so well. Tim, it's clear to me through this conversation that Amy was a little bit more of the driver with the Go With West community. Look at your life today. How much of a role does the community play in your life? How much has it changed your trajectory as a nomad? Our plan when we launched was it was just about us. It's we're going to go out and have this nomadic life and experience things. We also like to say that we are addicted to new. So we really like having new experiences. We like new food. I think this sort of also feeds into the diversity question you were asking about earlier. We we like new kinds of people. And so it's like we, we just really like having a, a, a wide range of things in our life. So when we meet people, maybe even just for a long lunch, it's not unusual that we have this instant connection and we we talk about let's plan future. Like a, we like to say about a month in a place and we'll say, let's keep like we're now that we're in touch. We're regularly in touch. And now we're looking at our future stops with these people in mind. So to say, okay, like it, it's life is better with this community, not this like with community. And, and what, and we find that our favorite, activities are one we love when we have a long time we're together 24 7 so we love our time together and we do have alone time together but uh, but when we are with people there's like this buzz i mean it's just it's, just, it's fun it, it's it's like literally summer camp for nomads at all times when we're with people so yeah so we so the fact that we try to com- get this going covid is is putting a bit of a damper on it but we've had quite a bit of it lately in mexico uh where we're i, I, mean, I mean we have cruises and people are on uh, other viewers we're going to be with them on the cruise and and that'll be i think that'll be just really great so i I think the trajectory is i think now we're planning with the idea of others in mind where before it was just the two of us i think that's part of the reason i was struggling with the answer i don't know that our our nomadic life has changed so much it's just what we're going to be doing when we so where we're going to go and what we're going to do when we're there i think it's just now it's more inclusive of, of people that we weren't necessarily considering before so now when we go to a place it's not going to be just the two of us potentially going and doing something. It's going to be a, a collection of people going and doing stuff with us. So I think our path is roughly the same. It's just we now don't know yet. people there. We don't know. Our path is that, forming. That's right. So this question is for both of you and broadening the conversation a little bit. Are there any downsides to the nomadic life? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I had major, major surgery in March of 2021, we had an obligation to a three month house sit starting maybe 10 days later. We were in Austin, Texas, and that house sit was near Washington, DC. And we were driving. This was during COVID. This was before we were vaccinated. We hadn't been on a plane during COVID until we were vaccinated. So we, I had to get in that car and drive Four full days. It was, I think it was pretty awful. And I think that it delayed my healing. Um, It made recovery pretty hard. Um, So that was hard. And also because my ACA plan only covered me in Texas, if I had any problems, I was out of luck. I was in a place where I didn't have any health coverage. So I I say that piece was, I think that's the hardest piece. There's a couple that, that there's many. I think that's one of them. By nature, we're, we're both planners. We like to have a plan. We like to know, and most people, I think, like to know where they're going to sleep on a, on a given night. In a given night. But uh, <laughs> we, um, so COVID has thrown everything for a loop. It's like, we don't know, uh, everything we planned in 2020 pretty much flew out of the window. Most of what happened came together in 2021 
was just happenstance. We really didn't have a plan for 2021. For 2022, we have uh, plans from where, through September, but we suspect a big chunk of that is going to change. And so Ooh, I hope not. Uh, yeah, it well, could. I should, it's maybe suspect is the wrong word, but it, it could potentially change. We have 50 nights in cru- on cruises. And Five so, cruises. Uh, who knows if, if that's going to happen or not. So this uh, we understood that we would need to be very flexible when we signed up for this nomadic life, but I don't think we realized how flexible we're going to have to be. Also, it's, it's really hard to sort of plan for what things are going to cost. So if, if, if our plans fall apart, we may have to go and do something that's going to cost twice as much as what we had plans planned on, on spending. So there's just a lot of, uh, you have to be really open to um, change. And I think there's a huge one that's a, it seems small, but it's not small, uh, is a lack of a routine. So both of us, we don't need every day to be planned. We don't need, but we have very little routine and, and it affects things like our weight, our cooking, our sleep, all that stuff. And, uh, and the, the trip planning, the, not, I wouldn't say the, the, our, our life planning. It, imagine if you uh, being a nomad, it's not like a vacation. So there's, there's, you really kind of, it's, it's quite different than anything that we could have explained. It's not like you're on a vacation. It's like you're moving your house every month. Like you're all the things that are required of you have to figure out where your new grocery store is and, and how to get to your mailbox and all, all of that stuff. We're doing it every month and we like it. So that, that's, but, but there, that takes a lot of time. And then you not only have to spend the time doing that, you also have to figure out where you're going next and next and next. And then when that maybe all falls apart because of COVID, you need to re plan the whole domino trail and and that really messes up with our ability to have a routine so i think what we're looking for that's why we're excited to be in one place for seven weeks we're looking at joining a gym we're like like let's let's get on a routine here talk about the difficulties tim of health insurance i mean amy mentioned the aca she mentioned her surgery this is a major concern for nomads isn't it yep uh so this year is the first year um since we've since we retired that we're going to have the the health insurance plan that we intended to have from the get-go. So this year, we're going to be on an expat plan, which basically allows us to be in the States for six months, and then we're out of the country for, at at the most, you can be in the States is six months. So um, it's a high deductible plan. So the plan, uh, I think it's $5,000 a piece that we have in terms of deductible. It has no preventative care. So basically, it's just there for in case something bad happens. The nice thing is, is that when you're out of the States, it's very affordable to have healthcare around the world. Um, but before we had the plan that we have this year, and, and the other problem with healthcare is that you really never, you, you can't, so unless somebody's filed a claim, they don't know how good or bad insurance really is. And so most of what you read online about insurance is about how cheap the premiums are. So there's not or a the whole, customer service signing up. Right. So there's not a whole lot of value in that information. And so until you can find someone who's actually been on this insurance plan, had an incident, has filed a claim, it's really hard to know. So we, the insurance that we signed up for, we signed up for through, through a broker and the broker assured us it's uh, it's going to be fine insurance. But again, we only have the broker's perspective. Prior to this year, we've had ACA plans, uh, which we were able to have highly subsidized because we have some control over our income. So that was nice. And we've also been on the Liberty uh, Health Shares. Uh, Liberty Health Share is a health sharing ministry thing, which we weren't necessarily fans of. But so we've been through the gambit when it comes to um, uh, uh, health insurance. But we, we think... This plan that we're on this year will be our long-term solution for healthcare. So, Amy, tell us what the future looks like. How are you going to decide where to go over the next year and where do you expect to be? Well, we have shared many times that one of the biggest lessons we've learned from this life is not to plan so far in advance. We're planned through New Year's <laughs> and it's <laughs> January. We're planned a whole year out. So we, and, but things fall in our lap. Well, we're September and then we have like four weeks in the States and we know, we just don't know the order because we are going to a conference. And the only reason we don't know what, yeah, we have a lot planned and then we're planned again, uh, November and December. We know where we'll be. So, um, but things fell in our lap that were too good to turn down. So, uh, so we were offered, uh, 
house sits in Spain from our viewers. We have a house sit in Edinburgh. Look, we're, we're not like, we're, we're taking those. We have cruises, these five cruises. They're $50 a day, all in, including gratuities, everything, $50 a person a day. We couldn't turn those down. So um, so we do know everywhere we're going to be. We're in Mexico until for four months. That ends in March. We're in the States for uh, six weeks. We hop on a cruise to Barcelona. We're around Europe uh, until September. And then we come back to the States, visit friends, family, doctors, and back to Mexico, rinse and repeat all over the world. Well, I wanted to thank you guys for coming on the show today. As I think about you and your trajectory, there's a lot to learn there, right? We could learn about financial independence and retire early. We could learn about the nomadic life. But what really caught me about your story is what you've done with Go With Less. I remember when you guys first went online with the Facebook group, and I think I was a member within the first 24, 48 hours. And just watching the numbers jump up so quickly, I have my own Facebook group for Earn and Invest. And let me tell you, my numbers did not jump up that fast. (laughs) But what was so exciting about it is just seeing how people interact in the community, seeing their pictures, seeing the exchange of information. I knew it was something I wanted to talk about here. That sense of community, I truly believe, is what makes the finances worth it. And I've said this before in my own personal journey, and I believe your journey too points to the same fact is when we figure out our finances, we're much better at figuring out who we are as people and what our identity is. And when we do that, we tend to find community. So watching what you've done with Go With Less has shown me how you've built this wonderful community around you. Uh, And it's impressive and it's a joy to watch. I wanted to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what is up next in your life and where we can find you. Amy and Tim, first of all, tell me what is up next with the Go With Less community on Facebook? I think we're just growing. We're, 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 we're in a good spot. So uh, there's something every day happening. I post every single day, like share. So every Thursday it, today is we're recording on a Thursday is show me a photo from your week. And that is my favorite post of the entire week because the people are all over the world. It's so inspiring. I thank goodness we can finally get on a plane uh, or else I'd be jumping out of my skin. Uh, so I, I think kind of more of the same things are, are busy and we're, we're not looking to, to bring new crazy things in right right now. I think we're trying to calm down a little bit. It's been kind of crazy for us for the past six months. So, so again, we're, I think staying put for seven weeks and just taking a deep breath is, is the moments that I'm in. I think so. So th- th- there's also some potential. And uh, so I, I, I brought this up before that, that there's tools out there that we might be able to work on that make it easier for people to connect outside of sort of Facebook. So we're trying to figure out how that might work. We have some friends that own some like intellectual property that they're potentially willing to share with us that makes it so that we can uh, allow people an, an easier mechanism to connect outside of our, our, our group per se. And Amy, if people want to learn more about you or ask you questions, what's the easiest way to interact with both of you? Uh, so go with less has no spaces is a key thing. And I'm going to say, so you can e- email me at amy at go with less.com. The better thing is to post it in the group because uh, the group go with less does take a lot of time. We are retired. So I think, so people used to ask me a lot of questions in email directly. Uh, I think what's nice about the group also is now it's not just me answering all these questions, but now you have other people who have all kinds of experiences. So it kind of does ease things up off of me a little bit and brings in new new people to to comment so i'm going to say join the go with less group on facebook and get involved put a uh a, a mem- uh, in, um, we call them a member introduction up share your story start posting start asking questions start liking and and soon like that, that's the best way and I'm, I'm crazy engaged over there this has been the earn and invest podcast and by having myself doc g i'd like to thank amy and tim of go with less the facebook group That's a wrap. Have you been considering investing in real estate? If you have, the best place to go to learn about this asset class is the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. Here, Chad, aka The Coach, talks about real estate and gives you all the tips and tricks But not only that, but he has guests on real proof of concept about how to reach financial independence by mastering this tricky asset class. Check them out. 
Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast with Coach Carson. It is a must listen to if you think real estate is going to be part of your financial holdings. The easiest way to get there is to go to CoachCarson.com. Again, CoachCarson.com. Take a listen. You won't regret it. Give me one second. Hold on. I'll be right back. Fix your laundry. That wasn't enough time to do laundry. Mm-hmm. I, but that- no, I had to just open the door so that my we have someone who's going to do the laundry, not me. And I just wanted to mm-hmm. let them open the, open the door so they knew they could come down. Anyway, so was there anything <laughs> we didn't talk about that you guys wanted to cover? No. Um, that, this is not a big deal. I've been do, but I've been doing something like this since my early 20s. I'm 53. So this is not like this didn't come out of nowhere. I've been doing I've been doing some version of this, not online, but uh, like all over the place my whole life. My what do you mean? Life. Forming communities? Yeah. So I've, I've been forming communities since I've been, uh, I guess, like 25 years old. What was the first community you formed? So there's so in Manhattan. So in Manhattan, so I left Boston because it was so unfriendly. I moved to Manhattan and I and I left Manhattan. I said, I can't have any more friends in Manhattan. Like, <laughs> holy cow, this place is so friendly. No one's thinking this about Manhattan. Um, but it, it was true. And uh, so this is before the internet. So I would go and I would make these calendars in the summer. There were so many cool free things. To do. I was not like the there was being frugal would not have been cool in New York in the 90s. And I would have been super weird. And so, but I did have these handwritten calendars of uh, here are all the free things happening every day in the summer. Every day there were like four things. So like maybe Garth Brooks is playing in Central Park or the opera is playing in Central Park or some Lincoln Center every day had a live band with different dancing every day outside, every uh, music, all kinds of stuff, movies. And so I would get groups together like, let's go see the movie. Um, and it's, I think it started with that. So I'd pass out my paper calendars to friends to be like, here's, here's what, here's the stuff to do. When I met Amy, she was oh, uh, yeah. That's le- a leading this group in Denver. It's called meet in Denver. And there are about 3000, 4,500 people okay, 4, in Denver, 500 people in this group that were, that it was sort of uh, similar to what meet up is, uh, and, but it was more uh, just about social stuff. For so the meet, most part. Do you know meet up? Yeah, I've seen meet up before. So meetup is really specific. So you can just be like, this group is pug readers who like Jane, pug, <laughs> pug, pug owners who like Jane Austen. Really niche. The meet in started at the same time, but it was the exact opposite. It's this huge group of people, no niche. Get together, so, go to a movie, get together and go bowling. Have it's people over for wine connection. tasting, have like, sure. I mean, go skiing, go hiking, go on a road trip, do whatever. And I found that when I was divorcing uh, my first husband, and I ended up leading the group and I would host like 15 events a month in that group. And all of my best friends were in the group. So every I, I'd see my friends all the time. And it was hard because I was had transplanted to Denver and then got divorced. So I didn't have any friends. So that so group helped I, me. When I first met Amy, she mm-hmm. was uh, like an independent contractor. She was a recruiter. And so she was really too busy with her social group to do her recruiting job because she was busy with this group of 4,500 people. Sort but of I had a lot of drama. So that's how I knew. No, like, <laughs> People would say, like, these men are hitting on the women. I'm like, oh, like what? Like, you're adults. I, I don't have time for that. Like, so so, the, so was, I had all the, the, the craziness that came with that. And that was yeah. a free volunteer thing. And the, the folks so to this day, when we're, like, back in Denver and we meet with this group of people, and they'll be telling Amy – you you were the best at this so it's like the people that led it after she's that she regularly gets like kudos from people that are that, that are still friends of ours from the group about how great it was when she was leading the group so yeah so I, i've always been into groups she's wired so <laughs> when i say this is a superpower that isn't just me being her loving husband this <laughs> it, it really is. is her superpower is go with less different than any of the other groups you've done before i mean certainly it's international right so that's a big part it is because just like what you said 
so I mean, so the the thing with this meet in Denver, it was there was no commonality. You're in Denver. That's it. So these this, weren't your people per se. Yeah. And these, and I and I know I have been taught we don't say tribe anymore, which hurts my like I, I like I like I get that, that's not cool. I get it. So I'm I'm PC. But like we're we're like we are finding our like our heart people here. Um but when we meet the people who are doing like this kind of cool, they're just living life differently is like, we're, we want to know where have you been? Where is it affordable? Where are you staying? How are you traveling there? Where are you getting around in? Where are you eating? All of this. And there's like this, un- and, and you want to not know that for just one place, but like the 60 places you've been, you want to know where you've been. I want to know where, like, it's yeah. like, we've unlimited information to share that it just, it's at a whole other level. And, and I think it's it, because we're sharing something that's a value. It's not like we're just sharing our kids are in school together. Our value is we're looking to live life. We're looking to get the best out of life. Um, we're looking to live life on our own terms. We're like freedom is a big thing. Experiences over stuff. Um, life is short. Like, like, like do, do your financial work, but then like, like make the most of what you've got. I think so, like we were talking earlier about um, sort of the challenges that we have with our nomadic life. The nice thing about meeting people who are doing the same thing is a lot of the challenges that we face, maybe they've already been down that road. And so there's there's just, there's great, we get great value out of connecting with people. So you, I guess I, I, this is something where it's not just about the, the social interaction, but it's like there's... Um, we find out about some new blog or some new investment or some new place or it's every time we're with a group of people, there's so like Amy said, the, the guy that we met here in Guadalajara, uh, he became a resident of, of Mexico. And so that process is something we're looking at. And so he had a lot of guidance for us. And so he turned us on to a bike sharing program here in Guadalajara. And so We've for, already signed up. So for 20 bucks, we'll have access to bikes in Guadalajara for the entire for a year. year. So, <laughs> So there's just there's a, a lot of value that we get from the community. Um, uh, I don't even know how to uh, you to get engaged in the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've I I've, I've thought this a long time, and I, I've just lately been better at, at putting it into words. But when you start actually finding your own sense of identity and purpose, the communities you form based on that are just so much stronger than the communities you form based on location or based on whatever, based on the fact that you both have kids who are at school at the same time. Right. So you have those communities, but it's a whole different feeling when it's actually communities based on who you are and what you really dig. And uh, I found that certainly with personal finance and podcasting and writing and all those kinds of things. And it sounds like you guys really have kind of with, with the go with less group. So it's pretty cool. I'm going to take it a step further is because also what you, you and us collectively, what is at your core is something that is not conventional. Mm -hmm. So you're not just like passionate about like you're what you like. It is, it is something that other people, your doctor friends, think you're insane. Yeah, yeah. They think they don't get you. They think you're crazy. You've worked, like they think you're crazy. And like, I, there's someone you might want to interview. Um, she's a friend of ours. Hmm. She was an uh, uh, ME, so she was an MD, a medical examiner. Mm-hmm. I think she was like at her residency. Like she finished. She quit. She quit medicine. But all the way through, quit before yeah. she even like made it. Believe it or not, a lot of people do that. Yeah. But she became a house sitter. Yeah. She fired from being a house. She was a paid. She was like a rover. We're not paid. She yeah. was a paid person. She was in Manhattan. Wow. Um, so she had a storage unit in Manhattan. She would house sit every single day in only Chelsea, New York, which is a really Tony area. So she'd only, and she had lots of regulars. She'd do dog walks all day. That was her income. So she'd walk like 10 dogs. That was her. So she didn't have any living expenses from a home in Manhattan. She lived in a great area because of her house sits and she fired that way. Wow. That's you, a crazy that, story. If, yeah. if, if you have a lot of uh, medical people, she would be a cool interview. Yeah, I'm try. I think I, I probably have less medical people than you'd think. I probably maybe <laughs> 25, 10, maybe 15 to 20 percent. Her story is still cool. Yeah, but but I'd be interested anyway, just because it's a cool, interesting story. But yeah, and now she's a nomad. Oh, wow. 
Well, thank you guys for doing this. I definitely wanted to talk about community and I thought you guys were the perfect people to do it. So thanks for coming on. I will edit this up and um, four to six weeks, most likely something like that. And I will send you a copy before it goes live. Perfect. And then I'll promote. Awesome.